Greetings, this is going to be part three of The Wall. Now, somebody asked me a question about The Wall concerning the uh, book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's a pretty wild book, but uh, just think, a wall sometimes is to keep bad things outside of an area, you know, like a, a, a wall around your house. But if it's a prison, sometimes walls are to keep bad things in. So let's go to Exodus chapter 14. And the background of this is the first Passover had happened. Moses and the children of Israel had just seen the hand of God with the plagues of Egypt, which... The plagues of Egypt people strongly mimic the plagues in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period. Uh, I mean, it's you look at them. Some of them are, I mean, identical. So not only did all the plagues happen, but then the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. I mean, you know, and the children of Israel had watch the Lord do all these things. I mean, there was darkness in Egypt, but in the land of Goshen where they was, it was not, there was no darkness. They had light. I mean, you know, so here it is. They had just left Egypt and that's the background. So let's, let's read. So this is the wall, part three. All right, Exodus 14, one. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, Zephon. Before it ye sh uh, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Now, when you see this word Baal Zephon, B A A L. Baal was just one of those generic words that means Lord. But it had become so entrenched in the uh, Satanist, uh, Satanism that eventually the Lord says, don't call me Baal anymore, because it became associated with Satanism. So when you see somebody's got the name of uh, B-A-A-L, I've heard it said Baal, and I've heard it said Baal, uh, you know, depends on if it's a short A or a long A. It's, you know, like V and the Caribbean, Caribbean, uh, tomato, tomato. What can I tell you? But when you see B-A-A-L in a name of a place or in a name of a person, uh, it's bad news. So, so here it is. God tells them before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? I mean, who wouldn't want to have a slave uh, do all their work for them? You know, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I'm against slavery, but, uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, have somebody else do all your cooking and cleaning and uh, tending to the garden. And, you know, it's, now we're going to have to go out and do it. So why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh 
king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, all right, so he's getting close, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? I mean, these are the people that saw the plagues of Egypt, that saw the firstborn die, you know, and now they're like, oh, well, we're afraid. I mean, come on, people. You know, you've seen all of the Lord's miracles, and and now you're you got no faith that he's able to save you. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Oh yeah, they were groaning that they were serving in hard bondage to the Egyptians. And they said, oh, if only we could get out of here and be free. And then the Lord lets them out. And now they're complaining, oh, oh, it would have been better for us to serve Egypt. And, you know, you know, God hates murmurers and complainers. I mean, absolutely hates it. I mean, let's face it. He gave them manna in the wilderness, and they complained about that. You know, if God gives you something, don't complain about it. That's, that's the Bob translation. All right, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today, and the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? <laughs> In other words, why are, you, why are you crying out to me, buddy boy? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So here it is, they're getting ready to go before the, the Red Sea, right? Uh, but lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow him, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. Now, I don't. for those of you that have never read uh, this account, they had a pillar of cloud by the day that was leading them. And then at night, it was a flame of fire that provided light. And when the cloud moved, the people were ready to start moving. And when the cloud stayed, the people stayed. They followed the cloud. And just remember something. Uh, Jesus is going to be coming in the clouds. So, you know, that's what I love about the King James. It just, all everything, it, it's like a, a finely woven uh, piece of cloth. Everything ties into everything. Uh, those of you that have listened to me for a long time know 
I, it's, I repeat a lot of stuff because all the doctrines tie into each other. So I don't know, but that's how, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, so, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, mo removed and went behind them. So now the, the angel of God, the cloud, is going to go behind them to separate them from Egypt and Israel. The Egyptians from the Israelites. Israelites, not Israelis. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Verse 20, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. So to the Egyptians it was darkness, but to the Israel it was light. Verse 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry land and the waters were a wall. And the waters were a wall. Hence the name of this Bible study. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry land and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. So how is it, you know, you're imagine driving in your car and all the wheels fall off. I mean, not just you, but everybody. I mean, you'd be like, oh man, let's get out of here. I I'm out, I'm so out of here. I'm done. Uh verse, all right, so when uh when the the chariots wheels are falling off. I mean, here it is. You got chariots all over the place. They can't move. And you probably got infantry behind them and horses behind them. And it's blocking the path. So they can't go forward. So what's, what's, what's up? What's going to happen now? Verse 26. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. All right, so in verse 27, it said, you know, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now there's some people that will tell you that this was the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea. The Sea of Reeds, people, was basically like a foot, foot and a half, maybe, you know, a half a meter, for those of you in Europe, uh, in depth. And they'll say, see, well, they just crossed the shallow thing. Well, and they say, oh, well, that was the miracle. Well, the miracle, actually, if that's true, the miracle would, is that the Egyptians drowned 
in a foot of water. <laughs> you know, so what can I tell you? All right, let's go to Acts chapter 7. Uh, the apostle, at least one of the apostles, are being interrogated in the temple by the high priest. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, men and brethren and fathers, hearken. In other words, listen. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon and from thence when his father was dead he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed or children and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. Jacob Israel, the 12 tribes, right? And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. And delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. All right, I want to stop right here and point out something. Uh, let me see. Now, during the time of Joseph, there was a group of people called, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, Hiskosk, I think. They were a Semitic people. They were not Egyptians. They were invaders. And they had conquered Egypt. And they were the ones that were in charge when Joseph was there. And uh, one of these people's... Uh, I think it was Pharaoh of this group that gave Joseph his wife, who was the daughter of one of the priests. So Joseph didn't marry an Egyptian woman, if my history is correct and knowledge of the Bible. But he married a daughter of a priest. So, you know, that's, that's what happened. And then... Uh, they were overthrown eventually by the Egyptians. And then when it says that, uh, and then arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, well, that's what they're talking about. That's exactly what they're talking about. So let's go back uh, and uh, let's see. All right, verse 11. Back to Acts 7, verse 11. So Joseph was in charge when the Hiskosk Empire was in charge of Egypt. They were not Egyptians. They were a Semitic people. And believe it or not, I had a history book. I had history books from like a hundred years ago from the uh, library that I got. They were throwing them out. And uh, I wish I still had them, but I don't. But it, they used to teach this stuff in the history books, believe it or not. Uh, you can't find that stuff today, though. No. All right, verse 11. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and that's a famine, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. And when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. 
And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. That's about 75 people. That is 75 people, okay? So that's, that's the, uh, his brothers, their wives, and children. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. And when the time of the promise drew near, when God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. This was probably an Egyptian, a native Egyptian king. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. Remember, this evil Pharaoh said to kill all the uh, male children in Israel. So that's why uh, God had no pity upon the Egyptians when he drowned them all and killed all their firstborn. So, verse 20, In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair. Fair is a, how would I say this? When you talk about, uh, let's say, Snow White, remember the story of Snow White? And the evil queen said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? It's talking about a complexion. Uh, there's only one group of people that have a fair complexion. And they're the people that have built the churches, printed the Bibles, and believed in Christianity, if you catch my drift. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. All right, let's go to verse 26. And the next day he, Moses, he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one another again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at the saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. You know, it's interesting. When you do a study on the angel of the Lord... Sometimes uh, it sh the angel of the Lord represented himself as God. So I, I'm of the opinion with a lot, some other Bible scholars that uh, the angel of the Lord was uh, not just an angel, but uh, the word angel means messenger, but uh, it was actually pre a pre-incarnated Christ. So, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Remember the burning bush? When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. 
See, the people were groaning, right? This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. Listen carefully. He brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. Remember all the plagues? And in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Listen carefully. This is he. Who are they talking about? A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he. They're talking about Christ here, people. Verse 38. Read this carefully. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and their hearts turned back again into Egypt saying unto Aaron make us gods to go before us for as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years? In the wilderness, yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch. Moloch was the name of a, a satanic god that demanded child sacrifice. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Rempham. Rempham has reference to the giants. Think about it. What star do the Jews carry around? Even the so-called Messianic ones. Think about that. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Rampham, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion of that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him an house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, whom have received the law, who have received the law by the disposition, I'm sorry, disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. 
and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness was laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. I'm sorry, I thought it was one of the apostles. It was Stephen. Calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You see, in verse 38 of Acts 7, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. He was at Mount Sinai, Moses, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. You see, the church was with Moses in the wilderness. You see, people... The church was with Moses and Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. I mean, you know, that's that's we just read that in the book of Acts. Now, remember something. The wall of water was protection for Israel, but it was it was destruction to the Egyptians. So sometimes a wall is to protect us and to keep bad things out, but sometimes it's to keep other things in, depending upon, you know, if it's a wall around your house or a wall around a prison. All right, let's go take a look at uh, the book of Job real quick. Chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. In other words, uh, he stayed away from evil. Eschewed evil means uh, avoided evil, hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually now he didn't do this for the daughters some people will actually tell you well you know job didn't care about his daughters well you know what maybe job had godly daughters but he had wicked sons i don't know maybe that's why he did the burnt offerings for his sons but not the daughters are not being mentioned here you know i don't know but uh, I'm sure Job cared about his daughters just as much. But, um, you know, but that's, I don't know. Bible doesn't tell you everything. So, verse 6. Here's the, here's the punchline. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Boy, is that a dumb question or what? Uh, God's going to ask Satan, oh, where are you coming from? Uh, what's going on? Like the Lord doesn't know, you know. <laughs> Lord knows everything, you know. So that's, that's why I say it's a dumb question. It's not a dumb question, but, you know, uh, like I've mentioned a few times, I had an attorney once tell me that a prosecuting attorney or defense attorney should never ask a question that they do not already know the answer to in court because they might get a surprise that they don't like. But that's the deal. The Lord already knows the answer, but he says, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. How's that for a, uh, an avoidance, avoiding a direct question. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, 
that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth God fear, uh, doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, does, doesn't Job fear you for nothing? Verse 10. Listen to this. Hast not thou made an hedge about him? What's a hedge? A hedge is a wall, generally, of living plants. So, Satan's complaining here. Yeah, yeah, you put a, you put a wall around him. I can't get in there. You're protecting this guy. Hast not thou made an hedge about him? and about his house, and above, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So Satan's putting forth a challenge here. Oh yeah? Take this hedge, take this wall away, let me, let me uh, do whatever I want. And I'll bet you he's going to curse you to your face, God. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, do anything you want, but you can't kill him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And if you want to keep reading, you can. A lot of bad stuff happened. I mean, there were people that attacked. There was fire from heaven uh, that destroyed sheep and his servants. Um, there was wind. I mean, you know, you got to realize this is not God doing this. This is Satan doing it. But he has to have permission. So... But what did, what, did, what did Job do? Verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return, return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. See, a hedge, a wall of protection. God puts a hedge or a wall of protection around his people. Sometimes he'll allow Satan to test and try us, but trust me, we'd all be dead if Satan had the power. And idiot Satanists actually think that one day they're going to overthrow God. They actually think that they are more powerful and they think if they just have enough people that they can do, that they can overthrow the Lord. Uh, and, and their argument is, well, you know, if, uh, if God was more powerful than Satan, he would have gotten rid of him. But he's still around and that's their argument. Well, the thing is, they're... Satan is actually doing a purpose for the Lord. We are going to be tried and tested. Trust me, we all have. Uh, let's take a look at something. In Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, obviously, the Lord's talking about people that believe here. Uh, unbelievers, uh, there's a heresy going around saying uh, we don't need to repent. And when they say that you, uh, repentance just has applies only to unbelief, well, you know, you could read Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where he tells his church to repent. So what is a believing church supposed to repent of? Their unbelief? Uh, what can I tell you? In Hebrews 12 and verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, 
whereof all are partakers. In other words, you, you get a spanking, you get a whipping for misbehaving. And people, let me tell you something, I'm, a, I'm an expert. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So if you're not being chastised for being doing bad things, you don't belong to this. You don't belong. You're not a son of God, one of the sons of God. And boy, I tell you, I've seen my I've I've seen my share of getting uh, my butt whipped many times. I've still got scars, I think. But I deserved, trust me, I deserved worse. All right, I think we're going to close this out. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries.